thank you very much um, for this opportunity to speak to you this evening. Um, so we're going to talk this evening about our project, Views of an Antique Land, <coughs> Imaging Egypt and Palestine in the First World War. Now we're going to do this as a double act, so I will start by providing the aims and objectives of the project, provide you with some sense of what we're aiming to achieve and how we're going about doing that, and then I'll hand over to Paul about halfway through, who will then talk to you about some of the things and the themes of the images that we found so far. So, um, as I'm sure you're all well aware, um, we are now currently um, in the centenary of the First World War, and we are part of the partnership um, by the Imperial um, War Museum. But our particular focus has been on the Egypt and Palestine campaigns, as you probably gathered from the title of our project. Um, now, there are several reasons for this, and um, a significant amount of the commemoration of the First World War, understandably, has been centred around the Western Front. Um, but there are, were many other fronts uh, involved with the First World War, and our focus has been to try and, through this project, and we're not alone, there are other projects, that are looking to raise the awareness of the profile of the campaigns in Egypt and Palestine. And I think this um, cartoon from Punch in 1916 gives some kind of sense of uh, thinking about the Egypt and Palestine campaigns. If you can just about read the um, caption at the bottom there, it says, bit of luck we weren't sent to Egypt, here it's a rotten place, all dust and heat and snakes and things. <laughs> so the idea is um, we're very much familiar with um, images associated with the Western Front, with trenches, with very little movement, with lots of mud. But the campaigns in um, the Middle East, in Egypt and Palestine, were often very, very different to this. Um, obviously involving deserts, but critically, often very fast moving. And there were hundreds of kilometers covered during the course of that campaign, going from the Suez Canal all the way up to Damascus and Aleppo, so we're talking several hundred kilometers there, and extending down um, Western Arabia through the Hejaz region, down as far as Medina. So it covered a very broad area, and in many senses was a different kind of war than what we're perhaps more familiar with than with the Western Front. Um, so thinking about images, um, this is a quote from Hilary Roberts' book of 2013, The Great War, A Photographic Narrative, and it comments on the fact that there are perhaps far fewer images of the First World War than we might well expect given the scale of the conflict. So there's a reference there to fewer than a million images, but the important part here is of those fewer than a million images, a very, very small percentage are of other um, theatres of war other than the Western Front. So we have, and we'll have information a bit later from Paul about just how few images there have been hitherto uh, for um, the uh, Egypt and Palestine campaigns. So to try and um, improve that situation, what we're doing is developing an online digital resource um, which will um, house or uh, be an archive for images that we're collecting um, that will be freely available to people. Uh, they'll be able to search and browse them and to download them. And I'm going to talk to you in a minute about how we're doing that. So we're interested in photographs that were taken by service personnel whilst they were out there and also postcards that they may have collected, so com commercial postcards and sent home um, uh, to their loved ones. Um, you have the web addresses there. The top of the two web addresses are kind of holding website as we're, we're developing the project. The lower website there is going to be the real online archive, which is just coming into being now. So, in order to gather our images, we've conducted um, a series of roadshows um, over the last two years, um, and we've been fortunate to be, have the opportunity to conduct our roadshows at a number of uh, military museums, including Firing Line here in Cardiff, uh, the Royal Regimental Museum, uh, sorry, the Regimental Museum of the Royal Welsh at Brecon, and we were recently at the Royal Welsh Fusiliers Regimental Museum at uh, Carnarvon Castle, which was very fortunate because we were able to coincide where they had the poppy display there, the, the weeping window of the poppy display there. We've also been to the Tank Museum, the Petrie Museum, um, the Manchester Museum, and we coincided, we were able to visit the T. Lawrence Society meeting in Oxford um, last summer. And then most recently we were at the National Civil War Centre in Newark and the reason we were at the Civil War Centre 
um, was because they were also housing an exhibition of um, Lawrence of Arabia at the same time. So that was a nice um, coincidence or we were able to collaborate there. So at these road shows, what we've been doing is inviting people to come along with um, collections of images from the First World War in Egypt and Palestine. Uh, so that gave us an opportunity to meet them. And during those road shows, we were making digital copies of those images. So we were either scanning them or we were taking photographs of them. So we're not actually collecting the physical images. They remain with um, their owners, but we are collecting digital copies of them. And then we are processing them in order to make them available online. Um, because we are funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund, one of the important aspects of our project is to involve volunteers in various different ways. So uh, we've been able to invite volunteers to join us at our road shows to help in the collection of images and the scanning and photography of images. Uh, and we've had uh, volunteers from the venues, the various venues we've been to, but also we've had volunteers from the Western Front Association from Operation Nightingale, which um, is a charity which um, helps the recuperation of um, service personnel who've uh, uh, received injuries during conflict. So we've had volunteers from them and from student volunteers as well and interested members of the public. We have some volunteers who have an interest in uh, photography who have been joining us as well. Um, so we have a range of volunteers and they're helping us in the collection of images and in the processing of images. But we've also been able to contribute to a series of workshops in schools in the southwest region. Um, our school here at Cardiff University has a program of workshops going out to schools and giving them a flavour of what it would be like to, do, to come to a university and study and think about um, the disciplines of archaeology, history and religion. So we've been able to contribute then with some of our images um, from the First World War. And some of those images include postcards. So we're interested in photographs taken by service personnel, but um, many service personnel at that time wouldn't have had access to cameras, so they couldn't take their own pictures, but there were many commercially available photos uh, postcards at the time that they were able to purchase and to send home. So we're also interested in those as well. Um, now on the theme of postcards, we introduced those into some of those school workshops and to get um, the pupils at the schools to think about the images, the postcards, we produced replicas of them and invited them to write their own postcards home to their families. And um, I don't know if you can read any of the text there, and, and it's actually quite difficult to read. Um, but there's some interesting themes coming through there that they're able to pick up through the workshops and potentially um, write home. But probably the most interesting thing that we found is how very unfamiliar they were with the whole concept of postcards in the first place. Because obviously with, with today, people are more familiar with social media, uh, mobile phones, so on and so forth. But the whole idea of sending a postcard was actually something quite new to them. And that was something we weren't expecting. And it might be something we might think about exploring in the future. Uh, we are going to have an exhibition of these. We're holding a conference a little later in the year um, connected with this project, and we'll have an exhibition of these postcards that the pupils have um, completed. We've got over 100, 120, I think, of these postcards so far. So in order to get these images online, um, we're working with the Centre for Digital Archaeology. I think you can guess where they come from, where they're based from this image here. Um, and they specialise in creating online digital archives for archaeological projects. So they're very well suited to the kind of thing that we're aiming to do. So we're working with them, and in the first instance, they've helped develop a database which will hold the information about our images. So as I said, we've been scanning the images, making digital copies of them, and then we need information about those images. So who was the donor, who provided them, who was the person who took the photograph or the postcard, the service personnel who was out there during the conflict? And then image about uh, information about what the images are depicting, the date, critically, if we can have dates of the images, and what might be on the reverse of the images. So many of them were um, postcards or they had information written on the back, which gives us further information about what the image is depicting. So we need to get all of that information into our database. And then we're able to upload it to our website. So when I showed you those two website links now, the lower of the two was this one here, and the website is just about going online now, so it is accessible. 
and the people will then be able to search those images. Currently, we only have, only have about 125 images up there, but there's more going on almost on a daily basis. But people will be able to search those images on a range of different themes to do with the type of image, um, the kind of what the image is depicting, um, the donor, regiments, and things like that, um, different forms of archaeology as well. And then access the information there. So there's an, uh, there's an image, we've seen that one quite a few times now. That's of um, wounded soldiers who were um, recuperating in the, what is now the Mina House Hotel, but it was actually a hospital at the stage of the First World War, right next to the Giza Pyramids. But then we have the information written on the back by the person who was sending that postcard back, uh, which we try and transcribe as best we can. And where we are able, we can add geographical information about those images so that we can, um, what's known as geotag the images, so they can be searched um, geographically as well. So if you're interested in a particular area, you can zoom in on that area and find all the images from that location. So that's making the um, digital archive online. So that's the kind of process we're working through now um, with our team of volunteers. But just to give you a flavour of what we've been getting, uh, our very first donor, in fact, and that's what the number one there refers to, and you'll see that the number in that kind of location on future images, particularly the ones that Paul will show you, refer to our donor. So if you want to find out more about them, remember the number, and we can track down the donor and let you know. Uh, but our first ever donor uh, provided us with a whole series, about 50, I think, of images um, sent home by Horace David Lewis, Private Horace David Lewis, who is in, as you can see, the Welsh Regiment, the Army Service Corps, and then the Remount Corps. But the great thing about the images that um, Horace um, collected and sent home was the fact that they've got very precise dates on them so that we can use them to create a sequence and we can create a narrative of his um, service out there. So we know he was in Alexandria in July 1917. He was in Jerusalem in Christmas 1918. And we see quite, we're getting lots of these kind of commercial postcards but referring to the Holy Land, so references to biblical places, which is a common theme in the images that we're getting. Um, he was in Beirut, but note beyond the armistice there, so April 1919. And we can even track his journey home. Um, he headed home via Marseille, and that's August 1919. So for quite a few of our donors, um, we've got this whole sequence of images which enable us to track their history and where they've been. But we also, so a strong theme of what we're doing is to create um, an online resource which helps to commemorate those that served in that um, theatre. But we also have archaeological objectives, as I'm sure you've probably gathered. And the important thing is having a sequence of dated images which enable us um, to document change for sites. So we get a sense of how they've changed in the last 100 or 150 years or so. So here's an image of the Del Air Bakri, which is um, on the west bank of the Nile, opposite Luxor. Um, it's the mortuary temples of Hatshepsut. And this is around about 1895, so obviously a little bit before the First World War. Uh, but it does show um, in the, fort, well, just behind these figures here, this building here, which was um, Nadal's excavation house at the time. A slightly later image, now this is from one of our donors, donor number 24, and I have a list here, which was um, the service personnel was John E. Morgan, he was out there with the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, and this is somewhere between 1917 and 1919, but the important thing to note there, if I just go back, is the uh, amount of reconstruction that's gone on the site. So Nadal's house is gone, but you'll notice the temple complex itself has been reconstructed with a second tier there, so we can track how these sites have changed, and very often that is for the benefit of tourism. And then a more recent photograph, you can see it's changed very, very significantly. So by gathering these, we're creating a resource which, which will be useful in tracking how these sites have changed. Another example, um, here we have Karnak, and this is the first pylon at Karnak, and notice this is um, part of the stereo view. Yeah, and, and this is around about 1895, so they're just excavating, clearing away rubble at the bottom of that first pylon there, and just about revealing um, the sphinxes here, the rows of sphinxes. A slightly later stereo view there, 
Um, the sphincters are revealed, but notice now that we've got water coming through here. So with the Nile inundation and groundwater rising, um, that's getting in the, the area which was previously being excavated, which led to some works on drainage. So now we're, as it says here, probably around about 1903, but no water. But what was subsequently then required was shoring to stabilize the monuments, and that's due to the, the, the excavation and irrigation, uh, sorry, drainage um, to prevent water damage. But then we have a picture from one of our donors, uh, donor 42, and that was um, the service personnel was Major Butchard, DSO. Uh, we know he was out there sometime after May 1916, and we can see there by that stage that didn't require all the shoring had been removed. I'm assuming it was no longer required, um, but it had been removed by that stage. So we are able then by having dated images to track that sequence. Um, I've we've just put this in. Um, it's a nice image in itself, but actually to refer to this person, as you, I'm sure you're all very well aware, Lawrence of Arabia, um, previously an archaeologist before he was involved with military intelligence and then on to the Great Arab Revolt. Um, we're not dealing specifically um, with uh, the activities of Lawrence, uh, but we have been communicating with various people who are. As I said, we've also been, we've been previously to the, the, uh, the symposium of the Lawrence Society last year. But also, um, Neil Faulkner has a project which is actually doing archaeological work along the Hejaz Railway called the Great Arab Revolt. And uh, so we're able to sort of communicate with them. So we have very, in similar areas, but doing slightly different things to raise the profile of this, this theatre. Um, but the interesting thing here, particularly for us, is that top image there, which shows um, one of the bridges um, blown up by Lawrence and colleagues during this part of the Great Arab Revolt. But in <coughs> our collection from one of our donors, we have a very, very similar picture, which we think might well be the same bridge, and we're trying to work that out. And as far as we've discovered so far, that is um, the first bridge after the Shajara station on the Hejaz Railway, which is currently somewhere along the border between modern-day Syria and Jordan. But um, I mentioned earlier about um, an interactive website, and one of the features of it will allow, enable people to make comments, and what we're really hoping is that people might know more information about these images than perhaps we do or the donors do. We're not military historians, although some of our volunteers are, uh, but there's lots more inform information about these images that can potentially be gathered by what's known as citizen science or crowdsourcing. So we're very interested in getting comments and feedback from people, which will enhance um, the value of the resource that we're creating. So that's something by way of an introduction to our project and what our aims and objectives are and how we're going about gathering our resource. But I'll now hand over to Paul, who's going to talk to you a little bit more about photography during the First World War and how they fit into um, some of the themes that were explored. Oh, thank you, Steve. Um, just to pick up from what Steve was saying earlier, the First World War is a very under-photographed <coughs> conflict, but that applies uh, especially to the First World War in Egypt and Palestine. One of the reasons for that is that the British only had, throughout the entire duration of the war, uh, 16 permanent official photographers, uh, and they took about 40,000 uh, official photographs. The best known, perhaps, of those photographers uh, is Lieutenant Ernest Brooks, um, who was uh, one of the first appointed and whose views of the Western Front are particularly uh, well known. The camera he is uh, <coughs> holding there is a press camera of the time, uh, German made. Both sides used German cameras. They were considered to be uh, the, the best uh, equipment. Um, I'm not quite clear what you did for spare parts if you were on the uh, Allied <laughs> side. <laughs> the German side encouraged photography, uh, both at official and unofficial level. Uh, a number of court photographers were appointed from the outset of the war, and soldier photography was very much 
promoted. Um, Photographs sent by German soldiers were made into postcards for sale to help raise money from, for the war effort uh, and so on. That was not the case uh, officially for the British uh, and Allied forces. And from December 1914, uh, photography was uh, officially prohibited, at least on the Western Front, by General Order No. 464. And that order was repeated again at various times uh, throughout uh, the war. And as you can see, this is a later example of that um, order. The official photographers took only 600 photographs of the Egypt-Palestine theatre. So it is not very well um, covered at all. As a result, many of the images that you see in histories of the First World War were actually taken by soldiers themselves. And a measure of how many of those images are around and unpublished uh, is perhaps the fact that our project has so far collected about 2,000 images, the great majority of which are soldiers' own photographs rather than postcards, though we have a large number of those uh, as well. Although um, photography was, at least on the Western Front, officially prohibited, uh, here we have uh, an order on official military uh, order paper. This is the copy of it from H.J. Uh, Butchard, uh, writing from campaign back to Cairo, to the photographic dealers, to uh, have uh, six spools of six exposures each for a number 1A autographic Kodak Junior sent up to the front for uh, his personal photography. And these cameras, um, the Kodak um, autographic particularly, uh, and a slightly um, earlier model, became known as the soldier's camera, marketed from 1912, but from 1915 it was realised that lots of soldiers had started to carry these, uh, albeit uh, illegally, and they, uh, um, <coughs> they were then marketed as the soldier's Kodak. Despite the ban on photography, uh, it took a little while to filter through, and amateur photographer in March 1915 publishes an article by someone who signs himself a medico, uh, presumably someone who had been sent home uh, to recover from injury, and he gives some uh, practical notes from one who has been there. Don't flourish your camera about in the face of generals. Don't take pictures that could possibly be of the smallest assistance to the enemy. Don't ever photograph the horrible, such as the execution of a spy. You will find war quite horrible enough without perpetuating the seamy side of it. Uh, as I say, this uh, article actually appeared after the ban on photography had been issued, but some of the tips which he goes on to give are perhaps picked up by those who were um, stationed in other theatres. Photographs of the First World War have really only started to be studied seriously relatively recently. Uh, and Richard Van Emden has attempted to uh, divide them up into several groups. Those which show friends and comrades, uh, the latest equipment and weapons, and the destruction of landscapes and the surreal landscapes that are left as a result of the conflict. And we can put uh, some of our photographs from the uh, Egypt and Palestine campaign into that context. Uh, those headings were devised for uh, the Western Front. <coughs> so, <coughs> friends and comrades, uh, some of these are uh, very imaginatively uh, staged. Some of them with a huge amount of detail. Uh, this, again, is from Major Butchart's album. Uh, he was meticulous about recording um, everyone in the images uh, and where they were. Um, some of them are also uh, dated fairly closely. We hope that when these are put onto the website, these will prove to be a, a very useful resource for military historians and help to identify uh, individuals in uh, other images, in, in private collections and elsewhere. 
We've seen the 63 wounded soldiers from the Mina House uh, already, <coughs> closely dated image, and photographs uh, taken in front of the Sphinx and the pyramids uh, were very much a feature of the campaign, as you'd expect, since there were large military camps around it. From the point of view of the history of photography, um, we can get a little bit of information about what's going on with some of these, uh, and we're even starting to be able to recognise some of the local guides who will come and pose uh, with the groups being photographed. Uh, you can see there there's a number 93 at the bottom. The local photographer would then take the processed images to camp and uh, be able to sell them to the soldiers. Uh, until very recently, the same sort of thing was going on in the Valley of the Kings. Uh, if you went with a tour group, uh, you would be photographed and someone would turn up later on to sell you the uh, image. The same thing is clearly going on uh, during the war. Some photographers uh, made a point of visiting the camps and taking uh, rather less formal uh, images. Uh, here we've got uh, a group and a very simple uh, rubber stamp used to mark it up as a souvenir of Egypt 1915. Groups of individuals, um, as you would expect, very popular. Uh, this one, uh, a group of signalers with their uh, heliograph uh, in an album which belonged to Herbert Standard. But his album is also very useful in not only showing us a view of one of the camps uh, looking onto the pyramids, but you can see um, an X marked on the side of the pyramid that is where the heliograph station was positioned so that you uh, could receive the daily communique from the residents in Cairo, which was, I think, something like 12 miles away, according to uh, his notes. So messages were being sent to and from um, the Giza Plateau and Cairo by uh, heliograph. One of Van Emden's other categories is the latest equipment and weapons of war. And of course, the um, epitome of that really is the development of the tank. Tanks were um, widely used on the Western Front, but about eight of them, I think, were sent to the Egypt and Palestine campaign. Usually, one sees photographs of these after their destruction. Quite unusual to see them uh, in uh, this sort of condition, being prepared, ready for battle. Uh, all the tanks were given names. Uh, the one at the front is just about recognisable, I think, as uh, Sir Archibald. This one, very clearly marked, HMLS. Um, and then we struggled a little bit with the name, whether it was uh, Otazel. Uh, it is, in fact, Otter's L, which it probably would be if you were inside the tank. Uh, at the time, <laughs> it must, it must have been uh, like an oven. <laughs> and uh, old Lucky here with um, a, a, an annotation from uh, the album um, Tank under repairs after the second attack on Gaza, lying in the Wadi Guzzi, Palestine. So we've got good um, geographical information for some of these images uh, as well. That same album includes photographs of two of the three pontoons which were used by uh, Ottoman forces to attempt to cross the Suez Canal uh, in 1915, uh, captured and put on display. I think we actually have in the collection pictures of all three of these pontoons, uh, but these two in this particular image. Lewis Gunners, in this case, um, doing anti-aircraft practice. And uh, aircraft themselves, still uh, a new weapon of war. Uh, these are repairs being undertaken to an aircraft engine uh, in January 1917 uh, on the outskirts of Cairo, where there were large um, workshops for aircraft uh, 
a repair. Also in Cairo, um, one of the great <coughs> bombers of the time, uh, the Hanley Page, uh, here next to uh, a smaller Sopwith Puff aircraft. Um, what turns out, we think, to be significant about this particular image is that it seems to be uh, this aircraft making a stopover in Egypt before going to join um, the Arab Revolt forces in the Hejaz. So this was uh, an aircraft being used to support um, Lawrence of Arabia and the Arab Revolt. Landscapes um, from the conflict. We have quite a number of images like this, which we uh, have tracked down, we think, to uh, Coelfa. This one is uh, labelled very helpfully um, the destruction of a transport convoy. And memorials. Here, uh, a memorial cross at Ramallah for the 53rd Division, uh, the Welsh Division. This crops up a great deal in soldiers' albums. Uh, it's something that um, virtually everyone, I think, who, who passed through and had a camera uh, recorded. We also have a number of views showing the temporary graves of fallen um, British and Commonwealth soldiers uh, like these, uh, often taken so that they could be shown to uh, the, the family of the deceased person, and also uh, in the knowledge that some of these places were uh, too remote for uh, families to, to ever visit after the war. They also seem to be uh, contrasted with images of the dead. Uh, here, um, an image of uh, an Ottoman soldier. We've had several similar images come in. Uh, clearly, people were not respecting the advice given by Medico that um, the, the seamy side, the horrible side of war, should not be photographed. Uh, this individual has had his uh, boots and equipment removed. Um, which seems to have been a, a common practice, scavenging. It was uh, something which was being attributed uh, largely to uh, the uh, local tribesmen. We then come to an area which is rather different than the kind of photographs which we're used to seeing on the Western Front, um, and that is looking at local colour, looking at, if you like, the um, customs and traditions of the people of Egypt and Palestine, and also the archaeological sites. One of the interesting things about these images is that it's very obvious that those who are taking the photographs are often um, emulating postcard images. So you see the same sorts of scenes being uh, repeated by amateur photographers and by uh, commercial photographers. The local police uh, feature very prominently uh, in both postcard and uh, amateur views. Uh, views of um, veiled uh, ladies, ladies with um, traditional jewellery and so on also uh, feature very commonly. There are lots of scenes of um, street barbers, street vendors, uh, local funerals, which seem to have been a particularly popular subject, uh, both commercially and amongst amateur photographers. Uh, days out, uh, here's someone from uh, the Royal Flying Corps uh, at what is uh, labelled up as the uh, City of the Dead on the outskirts of modern Cairo.
There is a particular awareness amongst the soldiers uh, and <coughs> service personnel in the Egypt and Palestine campaign that they are uh, in the lands of the Bible. And that's very different to what's happening on the Western Front, for example. This is from um, uh, one of the donors' albums, and you can probably read underneath, uh, the old caravan route across Sinai, used by traders between Asia and Africa since the beginning of time. Just a chain of oases in the desert. It has been trodden by the armies of the pharaohs, the Assyrians, Alexander and Napoleon, and last of all, by the British Army. <laughs> and there are photographs at some of these points uh, along the route. There is a, a real awareness uh, in the kinds of photographs that are taken and in the postcards that are sent back that this is an area of real historical um, importance. And it's not surprising, therefore, to find that uh, soldiers of all ranks visit some of the great monuments uh, in Egypt. Uh, here we've got from Major Butchart's album again, the same person who was requesting uh, film from Kodak uh, and who provided those very um, detailed views of his uh, fellow officers. Uh, the great forecourt of the great uh, temple, uh, and view of the great temple, looking southeast, uh, he's managed to climb up onto um, the, the buildings within the uh, courtyard, uh, onto the pylon, to be able to uh, take some of these views. From the point of view of archaeology and uh, restoration, this site looks now very different. And to have a dated series of images is one of the things that we are particularly keen to do with this project. Our hope is that we'll be able to expand this in future and go back, particularly for Egypt, to look from the beginnings of photography through to perhaps the 1970s or 1980s and build up a dated series of images. As Steve said, a great deal of uh, restoration and excavation has taken place since the First World War, and it's not always well recorded. Uh, here uh, in the album, um, rather less detail, it's labelled up as the Temple of Komombo. Uh, the one on the left is. Uh, the other is um, the Temple of Medinet Habu in Thebes. Uh, presumably these hadn't been labelled at the time, and his uh, memory for which site was which had slipped, with a number of views which are uh, mislabeled. Here, the Temple of Isis at Philae. Many of you will remember these monuments, along with the <coughs> great Temple of Ramesses II at Abu Simbel being moved in the 1960s, in advance of the construction of the Aswan High Dam. The first Aswan Dam, begun in 1899, uh, initially led to um, flooding, but the water level was kept artificially low. It was then decided that the water level should be raised, and that meant that between um, about December and March of each year, the monuments were flooded, and the only way that they could be visited was by boat. And here you see a group of uh, officers uh, taking a boat trip around, uh, the, uh, around the site. Uh, we've also had, courtesy of our colleagues at the Egypt Centre in Swansea, the donation of some images that were taken by uh, a military sergeant who was very interested in the archaeological sites and who took uh, a whole series of views uh, here uh, during the uh, dry period of the, uh, of the year. Uh, you can see on the pylons of the temple where the, the water level um, sometimes reached up to. And these, uh, these monuments have now been completely removed from this original location and recited on um, a separate island.
more usual views are the ones that are taken around uh, Cairo and around Alexandria. Uh, here, the interior of uh, the temples at the pyramids, the, uh, the temple of Khufu or Cheops, uh, taken uh, in 1917. And the so-called Alabaster Sphinx at uh, Memphis, not very far from Saqqara. The Alabaster Sphinx has been uh, much um, moved around for uh, conservation and uh, tourism purposes. Uh, you can see here that it's sitting in a hollow, uh, raised up on blocks to protect it from fluctuating uh, water levels. It's now considerably higher <coughs> and has uh, a wall around it. It's labelled in the album as being Saqqara, uh, the uh, dead city, Cairo. Uh, there's a little bit of confusion uh, about where it actually is. Presumably this is because the visitor uh, went to Saqqara first and then down to, uh, down to Memphis. And the Cairo Museum, <coughs> which had only opened in its present site, this is uh, on what's now Tahrir Square uh, in the centre of modern Cairo. Uh, it had only opened in this location in 1902, so the displays were uh, still uh, relatively new. Quite unusual for us to have uh, interior uh, photographs of monuments or indeed uh, museums. So this is a, a, an unusual one. Um, the gallery that you're looking at is uh, full of um, heavy sculpture by and large, though some of that has uh, since been uh, moved around. Uh, it's quite a, a useful exercise to uh, see the museum as uh, it was originally laid out. Uh, moving into Palestine, we also have some scenes of uh, destruction. This is the great mosque at Gaza. The official uh, historian for the campaign makes uh, a great point that the British were keen to avoid damage to monuments. Uh, clearly, it wasn't always um, possible uh, in the conflict to avoid damage. Uh, this building was later uh, restored in the 1920s. I think though what these photographs help to do uh, is to show the desirability of having dated images of monuments uh, because as we know they are still being destroyed uh, in conflicts around the world and uh, in recent, uh, in, the, in the last year or two, uh, a great deal of attention has been paid to trying to reconstruct monuments from early photographs and series like this uh, will be, uh, I think, very valuable in the future. So overall then, our project has yielded more than twice the number of official photographs which are uh, available in the Imperial War Museums. It's clear that that ban on photography was not widely observed and that at least in the Egypt-Palestine campaign uh, people were quite openly using cameras to uh, record not only images around the conflict but also the uh, ancient monuments that they came across. It's quite, quite a difference, I think, between what's going on in Egypt and Palestine and what's going on in the Western Front uh, in terms of this awareness that uh, one army is following the footsteps of uh, previous armies, that they are going to the holy sites in some cases. We've got lots of images of um, the monuments of Jerusalem, for example, and that they are 
sending these things back home. Uh, they are recording their uh, observations and their feelings about visiting these sites uh, in a conflict situation. That idea that these are antique lands and should be treated um, respectfully is something that's coming out uh, as a very clear theme through these photographs. Uh, they are rather different to some of the tourist postcards which are being sent back from uh, the Western Front. Uh, and finally, um, we should acknowledge uh, the generous support of the Heritage Lottery Fund <coughs> and our project volunteers uh, who have uh, allowed this project to uh, operate in the way that it has. Various institutions who Steve has already mentioned uh, provided uh, facilities for our roadshows, they hosted them for us, and uh, last but not least to Cardiff University, the School of History, Archaeology and Religion for providing a permanent uh, base for the project. Uh, and with that, you've probably suffered enough, so um, <laughs> I've told them it's a wine reception uh, and pay them <coughs>